Converse Church, are you ready to worship in the room? Woo! Converse, are you ready to worship in the room? Yeah. Jesus, we are here for you. Yeah. Hey! Clap, 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 clap. Say! Your spirit move as we shout your praise from my heart to your ears. All the glory's yours now, forevermore. Hear our worship, all we can give is to you. We're here for you, yes, we are. Hey, we dance. Come on, if you know it, and we sing, yeah, and we worship. You are the king. Cause we're here for you And we give, we give it all to Jesus Everything, we give it all to Jesus To the one who is worthy Our hearts are ready, Lord We're here to say oh, oh, oh. Sing it out We are here for Jesus Hey Let your spirit move as we shout your as we praise. Shout your praise from our hearts Sing all the glory is yours. Now forevermore. Forever here I worship, worship all. Worship we can all. give this to Jesus. Jesus, we're here for you. We're here for you. Nothing else will do. We're, we're here for you. You're here for Jesus, put those hands in the air. We are here for Jesus, Jesus. We are here for Jesus, Jesus. I love this part, it says it. If you don't come, if we won't move. We're desperate love for a touch from real simple. If you don't come, we won't move. We're desperate love for a touch. Let me hear you say, we won't move. Say. Just free love for a touch from Yes, 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 yes. We won't move. We won't move. Yes, you don't cause us. We won't move. We just free love for a touch from Jesus. Jesus. We won't move. We won't move. love. You don't cause us. And we see. And we worship you are king, yeah. Cause we're here, so we give it, we give everything to the only one worthy. The one who is worthy. Hey. Our hearts are ready. We are here for Jesus. So it's you, we won't move. Just we love. If you don't come, we'll stay right here. We won't move with just for love. We are just for love for a touch from you. We need, we need from the only one worthy, from the only one holy. We need a touch. He's our provider, our healer, our sustainer. We need a touch from Jesus. You have everything that we need, so we need a touch from you. Hey, we need a touch from Jesus. We need it, we need it, we need a touch from Jesus. We dance, and we sing, and 
and we worship you are king we're here for you and we give everything yes we give everything Okay, is, is anybody in the room desperate for a touch from Jesus, the only one worthy, the holy one? We are desperate for a touch from Jesus. Jesus, we value your presence. Your presence is so necessary. And now that you're here, we have everything that we need. Now that Jesus is here, we have everything that we need. We have everything that we need in the presence of Jesus. So we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, in this moment. We fix our hearts on you, Jesus, in this moment. You are the only one that matters. You are the only one worthy. And we believe every word that you speak to us in this moment. We believe every word that you release on us in this moment. We believe every word that you say. Every word is true. Every word is true. Every word is true. We believe every word you say. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me all oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me, whom the sun sets free. Oh, his free indeed. I'm Has ransom, his grace runs deep. It's what I was a slave to sin. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Whom the sun set whom the sun truly free indeed is free. Cause we are children of our Father. I am who you see. Come on, sing it to your father. Say, I am chosen, not forsaken. Yes, I am who you see. I am. And you are for me. You're not against me. Yes, I am who you see. I am. Oh, I am who you see. I am. Son. Forsaken. Yes, Jesus. There's a 
place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my father's father's In my father's house There is room for me There is room for me I'm a child of Jesus No matter what comes and goes No matter what comes and goes I'm still a child of Jesus We're still children of Jesus We are chosen not forsaken Yes, I am who you see I am So are you I am not forsaken Yes, I am who you Come on, sing it out I am chosen, chosen I am chosen, chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, for me You are for me You're not against me wrapped in shame we are not wrapped in condemnation we are not wrapped in guilt but we are wrapped in the arms of Jesus we are wrapped in the words of Jesus we are wrapped in what Jesus says that we are we believe who you call us to be we believe who you say that we are we believe it we have no other choice but to believe who you say we are we believe it 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 who you say we are, who you say we'll be, we believe it, we believe it. We believe, we believe it. I challenge you today to just lean into the arms of the Father. Lean into what Jesus says that you are. Lean into who Jesus says that you are. We believe it, we believe everything. accepted by Jesus, we are loved by Jesus, that's who he calls us to be, that's who he says that we are, all of our attention is on who you say that we are, Jesus, and we run from everything else, <laughs> we run from everything else, we are accepted by you, can you begin to open up your mouth and begin to speak to the Father in this moment, can we unify and begin to talk to the Father and begin to speak to the Father in this moment? I believe he's restoring identities in this moment. He's giving new identities in this moment. We believe it. We lean into. We lean into. We lean into who you 
call us to be We lean into who you say we are We accept it by Jesus We accept it by Jesus 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 We accept it by Jesus You and only you I have a seat at the table I know who I am I know who I am Yes, Lord yes, I have a seat at the table I know who I am I know who I am It's real simple, sing it out, come on yes, I have a seat at the table I know who I am I know who I am I have a seat at I have a seat at the table, I know who I am, yeah. I am loved by you, yes I am, loved by we are, I am loved by you, I am accepted, yeah. I am accepted, yeah. Accepted by Jesus, we are accepted by Jesus. That's all that matters. That's the only thing that matters. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a hope and a future. I know who I am. I know who I am. Yeah. I have a hope and a future. I know. I am, I know, come on, say, I have a hope, say, I have a hope, I know, I know who I am, I know who I am, I have a hope and a future, you've given me a new name, I know who I am, I know who I am, see, I am loved, I am loved. Well 
Focus on the love that you give us. And Lord, I, I pray right now that I can see the attack of the enemy that would uh, allow anybody to not accept the love that you give or to feel like they don't deserve it. Because <laughs> the truth is we don't and we never could earn it. But you give it to us anyway. It's your gift to us. And so we accept the gift that you freely give to us, the gift that we don't have to work for, the gift that we don't have to perform for, the gift that we don't have to beg for, so we accept your love, Jesus. We accept your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Could you just give Jesus a big hand clap all over the room? Amen. So as Nicholas was worshiping, I feel like I had two pictures running through my head. And the first one was a picture of... Um, somebody coming and giving me a check and saying, hey, Andrea, here's a gift. And me saying, no, I'm not worthy. In the natural, how many of us would reject the gift of a check or would we accept it? And then I also had the picture of me as a mom giving my children gifts. I don't make them work for the gifts. I love them. So I freely give them the gifts with no strings attached. And so that is God. As Nicholas said, we don't work for it. We don't earn it. Our job is simply to receive it, to accept it. But first, we have to believe it. So let's work on the believing part. God said it. His word is true. Let's just believe it. Amen. Amen. And so with that being said, I want to say hello and welcome to everyone here to Converge Live, our in-person worship experience. We are back in person. Converge Nation, don't miss out. Come on and join us. We are back and in person. And I love seeing all of you guys here, all of your faces. I'm so grateful for your presence. Converge Nation, we say hello and welcome to you. We appreciate that you join us each week via rebroadcast. We will never forget about you, so we say thank you for joining us. But if you can, if you're not in another state, another city, another country, come visit us here in person. And then for those of you who are here, if we have any first time guests, we want to celebrate and welcome you too. We say thank you for choosing to be here. You could have chosen to be anywhere on today. So spending some time with us here does mean a lot. And to honor that, we ask that you would stop by the Welcome Center and connect with one of our servant leaders. We have a gift that we want to give you. It's a token of appreciation. It's just our way of saying thank you so much for choosing to join us here in person. So Converge family, there are a few things happening that we want to make you aware of. And the best way to stay in the loop on all that God is doing here through Converge is to connect with us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at We Are Converge. All we ask is that you like the page, you follow the page, and then share with any fam family or friends that you know will be blessed by everything that God is doing here. And second, we are on day 18 of journeying through Jesus. It is our Lent Bible devotional. It has been amazing and we don't want you to miss out. So if you haven't started, I say it and I mean it. It is never too late to begin to read God's word. We want you to take this journey with us as we prepare our hearts for Easter. What we're doing is we're just walking through the last two chapters of Matthew and we are walking with Jesus and learning about his last days here on earth and what that means to each of us. So if you want to take the journey with us, all you need to do is open up your YouVersion Bible app, click discover, search for and select journeying with Jesus, and then click start plan. Or for your convenience, we have a couple of posts on both Facebook and Instagram, and they've got links to the, uh, the devotional. So just join us. Don't miss out. Amen. And then we talked about it last week. Our V groups, our Converge Spring Small Virtual Groups. Yes, 
We kicked them off last week for Converge Her, for Converge Students, for Converge Men, and it has been great. We don't want any of you guys to miss out, so if you have a student, they can join beginning tomorrow. We're meeting on Sundays at 1 p.m., and the students are walking along with their leader, Brother Coquetso, through Jesus Changes Everything. And then Converge Her is meeting on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. And we are studying warrior women with an emphasis on the book of Deborah. And then, yes, yes, I heard that. Woo, thank you. <laughs> and then we're the Converge Men, they're meeting on Wednesdays at 7.15 p.m. Yes, yes. And they are walking through Core for Men Transformed. These virtual small groups are a great way for you to learn, for you to grow, for you to connect in authentic community and meaningful community with other members of our faith community. So we don't want you to miss out. If you want to join us and you need more details, send us an email at echurch at weareconverge.com and we will get that information to you. Find your circle today and join our spring V groups. Amen? Amen. So here at Converge, we have some values, and one of the values that we have is generosity. We prioritize living with an open hand, not a clenched fist. And the reason that we do that is to help move forward God's vision and mission that he's given us here. There's a lot. At the end of every um, Blessed Life segment, you guys hear me thank you for um, helping life-giving ministry happen. And there's a lot that goes on to help life-giving ministry happen. What that looks like is everything that happens behind the scenes to make this in-person worship service happen. That looks like everything that we're doing for our digital ministry, our e-church, to happen for people who aren't able to come. That looks like support supporting our local and our global missions. That looks like things that you guys might not even be aware of, but the benevolence that we do to help support our local body. And all of that is a direct result of your generosity and your financial giving. So it's scriptural, it's biblical. We'll get into that one day. But if you would like to partner with us financially, we have multiple ways that you can do that. Here in person, we have ushers in the aisles with envelopes and ink pens. If you need one, just raise your hand and they'll get it to you. We just ask that you fill out all of those details on the envelope in its entirety. And the reason we do that is because we want to be able to properly record and account for your giving. You can also give via our mobile app. All you do is search the iOS and the Android platforms for Converge Church Plano and download the app. And then you can give online. You can give safely and securely by visiting us at www.weareconverge.com forward slash give. And finally, you can give via text. You just text Converge Give along with a dollar amount to 77977. And I do say it every week, but I mean it because I need you guys to understand how valuable it is and how much we appreciate you. We thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your partnership. And we thank you for everything that you do to help life-giving ministry happen right here at Converge. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the generosity of each person that is sown into the ministry here at Converge. All of it goes to lifting you up. All of it goes to lifting Jesus up so that people will be drawn to you. We lift you up and you do the drawing, God. So we will do our part to help lift you up in our seed, sowing of seed, God. We thank you for every person that has given. We thank you for those that desire to give and will be able to give, Father God. We pray blessings upon each person who has been generous, each person that has partnered with us, each person that has been obedient to your word to give, Father. And we know that it will go to help build your kingdom, to help reach the world, to help share the gospel, and that you will be magnified because of it, God. We don't take it lightly. We love you. We honor you, we appreciate you, and we magnify you today, God, because that's what it's all about. You, as Pastor Wendy said to us earlier in the hot huddle, an audience of one. You, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. Please enjoy the rest of the worship experience and take a look at these trailers about our awesome spring B groups. Amen. Are you 
I was told at a really young age that I was fat, so I just decided from then on that I was gonna make other people feel like that. So I turned to, to friends who weren't really a good influence and we started smoking a lot and doing a lot of drugs and drinking a lot. I struggled a lot with the idea of having depression. I had just called out to God like, God, I need you, like I can't do this on my own. Forgiving someone was really hard because I grew up fatherless and I really didn't know the definition of what it felt to be loved. When Jesus calls us, we need to realize the significance of what's happening. This isn't just some ordinary person that's looking at us and saying, hey, I want you to come hang with me. No, this is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. This is the creator of all things and he's looking at you. Now that we're graduated and going our separate ways, you feel like you haven't done enough, but you know that it was just my job to spread the gospel. I knew that God was calling me to not just have this relationship with Jesus, but to pursue other people. Now that I'm following Jesus, I know that He has a plan for me. He gives me the joy that I was looking for. He's just placed so many awesome people in my life, like people that just are there to just pick me up when I fall. When you say yes to Jesus, when you surrender to Him, you are a child of the Most High God. He made you with plans and purposes in mind, and He's not finished with you yet. Who are you? You are God's. You are His child. You are chosen for great things. So I wanna challenge you to surrender everything to Jesus, your past, your present, and your future. And as you say yes to Jesus, everything can change. Welcome to the battlefield of life, friends. Whether we signed up willingly or life has placed us here, we all need tools, language, and wisdom to win the war against our identity as women who are called to lead in any and all spaces. What is a warrior, you ask? A warrior is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Israel cries out for help and God sends Deborah. Scripture tells us that she's a prophet and a judge. People sought her out so that she could resolve their problems. And we could read this in our modern context and not think twice, but Deborah is one amazing woman. She was incredibly powerful and had the authority in a realm that many women today don't even have. As warrior women, we need to recognize the importance of our voice and the power of our words. That's exactly where we see our hero, Deborah, who rose to lead even the mightiest of men with the kindest of actions. So in a world that is dying for leaders to rise and make ways where there are no ways and to tread on paths where there are no paths, this is your invitation to be a warrior and a leader. You might be sitting here thinking, I'm not a leader. I am just a mom or I'm just a student or I'm just a manager. No, 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 you know what you just are? You are just a child of God and that's all you need to be. May we never be people who ignore the voice of God to rise to the occasion and passionately follow him no matter the cost. You may not feel like a warrior, you may not look like a warrior, but you are a warrior. So fight on, sis, because victory is yours. filled with these amazing moments of laughter and joy and celebration. It's also filled with moments of despair, resentment, and fear. For men, the soundtrack of culture tells us that we must avoid vulnerability at all costs, that we can't be weak, that we can't be humble, that we can't be honest, and we certainly can't have fear. But that's not what Jesus said. And this is exactly why we started CORE. CORE exists to put men in community 
to help equip them to answer some of life's most difficult questions regarding purpose and identity. We don't have to live in fear of our struggles and our brokenness anymore. We can face it together and we can find courage and hope that we never even knew existed. CORE is the best resource to build foundation and brotherhood. It's like nothing I've ever seen. It's simple, it's targeted, it's gonna impact your life. You're gonna find a safe place where you can be authentically who you are without judgment from another person. CORE expresses the diversity, the color, that's in Christ. There's been a lot of curriculums that are out there, uh, but this is gonna be the greatest men's curriculum for reaching a city. I've been in ministry for over 17 years and I've done a ton of men's studies. We've used lots of great material, lots of great video content, um, but CORE just blows them all away. Nothing else that I've ever used has been able to get guys to that authentic level of community that they need in order to grow from, in order to really discover who Christ is. There's something in it for just about every man. Ethos is of art, ethos is of the military, ethos is of sport, but the themes are transcendent. What does it mean to be a man? Who am I? Why am I here? It makes for a very powerful tool to reach the heart of a man. When I did core in my home, I've never seen such authenticity in men. It asks these probing questions that unlocks the honesty, the rawness, the vulnerability. We didn't see a lot of drop off. We didn't see men say, all right, that was, that was corny, didn't relate to me, you know, a bunch of white stuff. Because of the quality of the video, the production, and the authenticity, there's no pretenses, there's no religiousness per se. It's just raw, it's real, it's visceral. I'm a dad, got four little kids another thing to do at night during the week didn't really appeal to me. Over the course of 10 weeks, I left with a depth of relationship that I didn't know that I needed. The compelling journey it begins to take you on. I, my heart begins to be transformed and I am not the man that I used to be. I thank God for that. I've really seen for myself that CORE has been the thing that's turned the tide. I can do this. I can get beyond this. We are going to see revival happen in our communities when they become submitted to God dealing with just junk in their lives. In cities that need justice, you can't find a better way to start becoming relevant and solve the problems in CORE does by how it changes a guy from the inside out. And he starts making new choices because really that's the bottom line. We need to be reminded that there is hope, that our past does not dictate our future, and that shame and insecurities don't have the final say. To help make this a reality, CORE provides resources built on the power of storytelling to create space for men. Space where we don't have to have answers to all of our questions, where we don't have to try to fix ourselves first, where we can come as we are without being judged. CORE is a place where we can connect with other men and learn how to be brothers. Brothers who are sharing about our struggles and our dreams. Brothers who are journeying together to discover who God says we are and what He's made us for. Good evening. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say good evening because I just time stamped the worship experience, but good evening. I'll start it again. Just out of habit. All right, so here it is. What do I say? Hey, everybody, how y'all doing? Awesome, awesome. It's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us for Converge Live. And for those of you watching online, thank you for joining us virtually. We're so excited uh, that you're with us, that you've joined us for today's broadcast. It is week six of our current sermon series that we're calling Verses, He Said, She Said, and The Truth. And listen, I'm super excited because today I get to tag team with 
Ma Mocha Princess. She's going to bring a unique female perspective to the conversation. I'm going to do my best to speak on behalf of all the men, but ultimately we want to land on the truth of God's word. Amen? Uh, Pastor Wendy, would you like to greet the people before we dive into the word tonight? Greetings, people. I'm so glad to be with you. It is always uh, a good thing. You know, the psalmist wrote, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. And I think as times and seasons and birthdays pass, I am learning to be more appreciative and I see the value of that. So thank you all that are here tonight live and thank you that are joining by uh, rebroadcast. But it is a good thing. It is a and good thing. And we talked to the team earlier and I was just encouraging them to not be weary in well-doing. Amen. That as we see so much going on, is that we have a hope. We have an anchor that will keep us. Amen. And so I don't think I've spoken on the microphone in a long time, and I just feel a little preach going on. So I'm just going to say <laughs> greetings in closing and throw it back to Pastor. Amen. Amen. Well, that's very kind, very generous of you. Uh, listen. Before we dive into the word, uh, I just want to say that membership has its privileges. And uh, so a few weeks back, when we first kicked off uh, the sermon series, uh, we also offered a supplemental uh, online Bible study called The Good Fight. And we learned some powerful principles about what it looks like to fight fair. Listen, Converge, conflict in relationships is inevitable. Misery, though, is optional. And so we had a fantastic time, man, working through conflict, conflict resolution, how to fight fair, how not just to solve the problems you experience in relationships, but also how to manage the tensions. Uh, a lot of times we think that everything in life is a problem to be solved. But sometimes the things that we label problems are really tensions that we need to manage, and we learned the difference. And so uh, it was one of our uh, sort of, uh, not just traditions, but it's sort of our culture, our DNA here at Converge, and, and, and uh, Andrea alluded to it, we live with an open hand, not a clenched fist. So uh, we have some, some uh, prizes to present uh, to, uh, man, I don't know how to describe these guys other than that they were a triple threat. <laughs> Come on, somebody, because uh, every week, we had this Q&A time, man, and they were on top of it every single time. Show your love for Mr. and Mrs. Mack. Why don't you come? Because we got a little something for you. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, you can come on up so everybody can see your muscles, man. See you rocking your smedium. Come on, somebody. It does, it does. It fits really well. Thank Mr. and Mrs. Mack, thank you for participating, you. but also for being engaged, right? And, uh, and not just... Uh, participating, but also internalizing uh, not the principles and the truths and putting them into practice in your own life personally and in your relationship. Uh, Mrs. Mack didn't come up. She is great with child. We celebrate you guys. Congratulations. Love you. Love you, love you, love you. Amen. Yeah. And uh, uh, we've got another uh, presentation because this guy has been consistent since day one fairly new to Converge Church, started coming uh, when we started meeting here in McKinney, but he has been incredibly consistent, not only in his church attendance, but also engaging in our men's groups. I mean, every time we have something outside of Sunday morning, he's there, he's actively engaged. Everybody show your love for Rob Meister. Yeah. Rob, why don't you come on down? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for being a part of the good fight, man, and having Bless those you, awesome Pastor. conversations. Pastor Wendy, God bless you. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. We have one more prize to give away uh, for those who participated. Uh, Chuck and Sabrina Smith, they're not with us uh, tonight. Uh, they are traveling on vacation, but when they get back, we'll make sure uh, we bless them as well. Anybody else ready for the word? Yeah. Yeah. Before we do that, I just want to say two words to you. You guys ready? Two words. Converge worship. Yeah. Come on, somebody. And our special guest tonight, Nicholas Trailer, uh, man, for just taking us into the presence of God and reminding us that we're chosen, yeah. that we're accepted, and that we're loved. Uh, thank you so much. Nicholas's manager is here as well, man. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I see you got your boo 
on your left side. And uh, thank you guys so much for being with us tonight and uh, for blessing. Come on, let's show them a warm, converged welcome. And uh, God bless you. God bless you. All right. So I think this is the part where we dive into the word together. Uh, let's pray and we'll do that. Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus. Father, we approach your word now with great humility and reverence, and we thank you for the wisdom that comes only from the Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive all that you desire to say. And God, beyond what might be popular, Father, we yield to what is prophetic and what is powerful and what is able to transform us from who we've been into the men and women that you have called created and chosen us to be. We yield now implicitly to the truth of your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said a good amen and amen. As I said earlier, listen, it is week six of he said, she said, and the truth verses. And I'm going to ask you, baby, you can be seated. Actually, we can be seated for a little bit because you know me, I'm going to jump up on my feet. But you I was going to ask you. You forgot that these stools were not... I am very sister sorry. Friendly. They're not sister friendly. Mm -mm. I totally forgot. They are not Do we need to switch them out? Let's see if we can switch them out. If we have an alternative, uh, one of the ushers, can you guys I help us out? I don't think we have it, but I have a good stance. We have so, a good stance. Yeah, so I am I can, very sorry. I can um, dig my heels in. I did not take that into consideration. My it's bad. Okay. Amen. Amen. So I may stand up the whole time because then my shirt is slippery and I feel like I'm just going down. <laughs> like you're sliding down. <laughs> I am very sorry. That's okay. We will take that into consideration the next time. Listen, men, learn the power of I'm sorry. Amen. The three hardest words you will ever say, man. Come on, somebody. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And what's the sh 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 source? Come on, somebody. I still don't know how to say it. Worcestershire. 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 Okay. Yes. Say the W, the W sauce. Come on, somebody. Learn the power of I'm sorry and I was wrong. It will diffuse a lot of conflict in your relationships. All right, so last week, I talked about a little bit about my dream versus battles, if I could organize, coordinate, facilitate a dream versus battle. And uh, so what about you? Any, any, any dream versus battle that you think would just be outstanding? Because that's what this series, we kind of borrowed from pop culture. And, uh, and so some, many of you have seen the versus battles that became really popular during the lockdown, during the pandemic. And this is our biblical version of that. Any, any, I, can, I, can I throw one out there? Yes. On your behalf? Yes. <laughs> because your pastor Wendy loves her some new addition. Come on, somebody. Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike, and Johnny. And uh, I think, Ralph. and Ralph. Ralph, oh, you were in love with Ralph, weren't you? Oh, let me tell the story. Since you opened up the door, I'm going to walk oh, on Lord. through. So <laughs> Pastor Ray takes me, I think it was 2011, to the Verizon that, here in Dallas right. to see New Edition. Well, you know, New Edition is a little older than me. I'm 51, so they're in their mid-50s. They can still move and do everything great. So there is this usher at the Verizon. He was like... If y'all didn't know this, New Edition, they real cool. Like, if you just go around to the gate, like, by their bus, they'll meet you out there. You can get their autograph. You can get pictures with them. They just, like, cool like that. So I figure, hey. So we go around, and they are actually cool like that. So I yeah, walk up to Ralph, and Ray is with me, and I said, Ralph, you never wrote me back. I'm the girl that sent you all of those letters in the red envelope from your address that was in the back of the ride on magazine. He was like, oh, snap, that was you. I said, it was me. He said, my bad, I'm sorry. I was like, it's all right, it's all right. You didn't give me any play, and so now I'm married. He was like, good looking out, dude. So then Michael Bivens went up to Ray, and he said, Dude, I like your kit. And then Ray was like, oh, just a little something, something. So then I leaned up against the gate because Bobby Brown wouldn't come from around the gate because, you know, it was some other kind of sisters waiting for Bobby. This was 2011 <laughs> before Bobby was remarried, so wife. This, So I go by the gate, and we taking jailhouse pictures because he wouldn't come from out the gate. And I'm telling on you, Bobby, Bobby Brown scratched in the back of my head. You know, he had his hand on the gate, and he going to try to scratch, scratch like that. So I turned around, and I said, Bobby, I still got it, but it ain't nothing I could do with it. And then I smiled for the picture, so. 
It was a lot of fun. Yes, it was a it lot, was a lot of, fun. of fun. But I think an incredible versus battle would be uh, New Edition and Boys to Men. Oh, yeah. Ooh. I think that would be a, a fantastic yes. versus battle. I think. That would be. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Who would you root for? I would you be like both faithful, so I am going to stick with New Edition because I love them first. Yeah. However, I have seen Boys to Men. My sister got me tickets for a couple birthdays ago. And Boys to Men actually went to the Philadelphia School of Arts, right. so they have a strong classical background. And so the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra played behind them, and they can sing. So they are good, but I'm going to be loyal and stick with New Edition. To New Edition. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Well, without further ado, we're going to dive into the Word. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Our anchor text uh, last week, as it is today, is lifted from Matthew chapter 22, uh, beginning at verse number 34. Familiar passage of Scripture, and this will give context to what we share today. In fact, our focus last week, as it is today, is not necessarily on our interpersonal relationships, which we spent the lion's share of our time unpacking and, 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 and really processing, but we really want to spend, wanted to spend some time having conversations about what it looks like to love yourself. It's one of the, the, the relationships we often ignore. Uh, in fact, the text tells us, and I'll just paraphrase, that the Pharisees come to Jesus, they try to trick Jesus in his words, they try to test him, and they say, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Without hesitation, Jesus responds, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And what we learned last week is that there are really three relationships that Jesus addresses. The primary relationship, the most important, is our vertical relationship with God, that we ought to bring our hearts and our minds, our thoughts into vertical alignment with God. A lot of times we think there's just two, that the second relationship is, well, if I love God and I love my neighbor, then I'm good. In fact, for many years when we were city church, our tagline was love God, love people. Israel Holton had a whole album called Love God, Love People. And for most of us, and for even most of my Christian life, I thought if I would love God well and love people well, I had the vertical right and the horizontal right. And what I missed was the fact that Jesus said that we ought to love our neighbor, come on somebody, as we love ourselves. That our ability to love others is directly related, a direct relationship with how I've learned to love myself. Now, the degree to which I love myself ought to be a direct reflection of how much God loves me. That's very important to grasp. Because if we don't understand how much we're loved by God, we end up looking for love and affirmation in all the wrong places. Because we're all created for this sense of acceptance and to be validated and to be valued. In fact, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, your mind, what he's really saying is that is actually your response to God's love for you. That we don't initiate it. In fact, 1 John says it this way, this is love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And so tonight, we're going to focus on this relationship where you and I learn to embrace how much God loves us so that we can love ourselves and so we can love our neighbor. And your neighbor is anybody other than yourself. So that's how you love your spouse. That's how you love your children. That's how you love your coworkers. That's how you love anyone within your sphere of influence. This is a big deal. And I don't think we recognize how significant this is. And I talked about it at length last week. And to help us uh, understand how we miss this on a very granular level, on a daily basis, I'm going to share this video clip. And it's a campaign that Dove, uh, the Dove uh, beauty brand uh, uh, did I think in 2011, and the reason Dove did this campaign 
was because they discovered through their research that only 4% of women in the United States consider themselves beautiful. That means if we had 100 women in this room right now, only four out of 100 would consider themselves beautiful. And as a result of that, Dove did this campaign. And I want to share this video with you. It's about six minutes long. Then Pastor Wendy and I will come right back and dive into today's content. Watch this. I always thought people were so cute and they have the little cheeks and they're like rosy, but mine are pretty plain. If I was going to change one feature about my face, I would say that I would want fuller lips. I'm definitely a person that looks tired when I'm tired, and when people say that, I immediately am like, oh, man. I'm starting to already get little crow's feet and stuff, which, like, my mom has, so, yeah. I'm a forensic artist. I was trained at the FBI Academy in 1993 in composite art. Worked for the San Jose Police Department as the police artist from 1995 to 2011. We didn't really know what we were doing, so that was nerve-wracking for everyone. I showed up to a place I had never been and walked into this big warehouse, and at the very end, there was a guy with his back to me with a drafting board. I had a curtain separating me so that I don't see him. Um, we'll begin. First of all, tell me about your hair. Um, brown, long, I guess a little bit past my shoulders. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. Yeah, they're brown eyebrows, dark brown eyebrows. Okay. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. I guess I haven't really compared it to anyone else's chin, but um, especially when like I smile, I just feel like it kind of protrudes a little bit. Hmm. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. You sort of realize, oh man, now I, I have to talk about myself and, and, and think about my looks. I'm 40, so I'm starting to get a little bit of the crow's feet thing going on. Um. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. I still didn't know. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin was a nice, thin chin. Mm. The women were really critical about moles or scars or things like that. And yet, they were describing just a normal, beautiful person. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke and were very expressive. The length of the nose, what is that like? A short. Short? Yeah, cute nose. Her face was fairly thin. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. OK. So here we go. Mm. So this is your self-described image. And then somebody else described you and did this sketch. This whole thing about having dark circles and crow's feet around my eyes and that was not part of the sketch at all that the stranger did. The stranger's was a little more like gentle. That's pretty different.
she looks closed off and fatter. She just looks kind of shut down. Looks sadder, too. The second one is more beautiful. You think they're catching more of that from you? Yeah, yeah. 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 She looks more open and um, friendly and happy. I've come a long way in how I see myself, but I think I still have oh, some way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have some work to do on myself. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. Chloe's perception was so, so clearly different. Her picture looked like somebody I thought I would want to talk to and be friends with, like a happy, light, much younger, much brighter person. It's troubling. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Our self-perceptions are generally kind of harsh and unbecoming when really that's not how the world sees us. spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. I wanted to share that video with you tonight because it puts a very human spin on the principle that we have been sharing. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because how I see myself impacts how I think others see me. Yeah. And sometimes it is totally unfounded. If you consider Numbers chapter 13 and, and chapter 14, God sends 12 spies into Canaan, the land that he had promised them and said they would possess. After 40 days in Canaan, the 12 spies come back. 10 of them bring an evil report. Only two of them bring a good report of what they saw and what they observed. The evil report that the 10 brought back went something like this. The land is flowing with milk and honey. Everything you said about it is true, except we saw the sons of Anak there. They're giants, and we were grasshoppers in our own eyes, and therefore we were grasshoppers in their eyes. The only problem I have with their evaluation of their assessment is that if they went in as spies, nobody knew they were there. And therefore, no one saw them to observe that they were grasshoppers and they were giants. There was nobody making a comparison about them except themselves. They saw others as giants, saw themselves as grasshoppers, and they reasoned that if I see myself as a grasshopper, surely they see me as a grasshopper. And what was so telling about what we just saw on the screen is that the people who described them had portraits that were more accurate than their descriptions of themselves. Imagine that. That others see something in you that you don't see. And what others see in you is often a more accurate description of who you are. You know why? Because every one of those women described themselves based on their flaws and everybody described them based on their beauty. And the truth is, when you and I stand in the mirror, 
The thing that we're fixated on is all the things that we think are wrong about us. And it causes, it drives, and it informs how we move through life. And we begin to pro project our self-perception. I'm a grasshopper, so everybody must think I'm a grasshopper. I ain't nothing, so everybody must think I'm nothing. And it begins to impact how we engage and how we interact. And that's why Jesus said, listen, all of the law and the prophets, all of this Bible, the law, the Torah, the first five books, and all of the prophets, because Jesus is speaking before the New Testament. He said, everything you have read up until now hinges on these two commandments, being able, listen, to receive God's love for you, which will determine how you love yourself, which will influence how you love others. It's a big, big deal. It is a big, big deal. Now, before I say anything else, I'm going to let my beautiful wife chime in. Remember, remember, only 4% of women, and I believe the number is just as true for men, only 4% believe I'm beautiful. Yet when God sees you and me, his estimation of us has absolutely nothing to do with our performance or our achievement. Remember, God spoke from heaven and declared concerning Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Notice that God said that at the beginning of his earthly ministry, not at the end when he had an opportunity to perform his way into the Father's approval. You know why? God didn't need Jesus to perform his way into his acceptance. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God does not need you to perform your way into his acceptance. His acceptance is something you and I simply receive. Because God says you're accepted. Well, what did I have to do to be accepted? No, you are accepted. You are chosen. Well, what did I do to get chosen? No, I just chose you. You are loved. Well, what did I do for you to love me like this? Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, when you and I were still toe up from the flow up, when we were still broke, busted, and disgusted. God said, I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate how much I love you, not while you're perfect, but in spite of your imperfections. So my ability to see myself in a healthy way has absolutely nothing to do with my performance. A perfect God, a loving God has said, you're beautiful, you're accepted, you're chosen. And guess what? If God, who is perfect in all his ways, says, Ray Harmon, I love you, and you're perfect, ain't no joker on earth. Ain't no imperfect, broken person who's just as busted as I am is going to be able to define me. When a perfect God has said to Ray Harmon, you're accepted. And the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, most of us don't even allow ourselves to spend enough time in the presence of a loving father who will validate us and speak over us, not because all the great things we've already done, but who will say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And when you hear the father say that concerning you, there ain't no wife, ain't no husband, ain't no child, ain't no co-worker, ain't no boss, ain't no neighbor. When you, when you settle once and for all in your heart what God has said about you, can't nobody undo that. I'll say that again. Can't nobody 
undo that. I got to say this. I got to say this. Can I say it, baby? Are you ready to jump in? I got to say this. In fact, let me look at my notes. Where's my notes? What's my first point? Because I'm getting ahead of myself. Here it is. Here they are. Uh, Drop your anchor. Drop your anchor. Today, this is one of five instructions God's going to give us. And the first instruction that God wants us to heed and embrace. He wants us to drop the anchor of our life in his love. So that we don't drift with every wind of change or disappointment. Right here, right now, he's asking us to settle this once and for all so that our lives begin to stabilize. I'm going to drop my anchor in the sea of his love so that I won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of change and disappointment. You say, Pastor Ray, what are you talking about? Here it is. Here it is. There's two men that followed Jesus in close proximity. First one is Peter. There's 12 disciples. There were there two of them that followed Jesus in close proximity. The first one is Peter, and the second one is John. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter has this revelation of Jesus, and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, right? Jesus said, flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. A few verses later, a few verses later, Jesus begins to tell Peter the kind of death that he'll die. And this is what Peter said. Y'all ready for this? Do I have it in my notes? Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 21. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took Jesus aside. So Jesus is telling him the kind of death that he would die. So here's Peter. He takes Jesus and pulls Jesus aside. Notice what the scripture says, and began to rebuke him. So this is Peter telling Jesus or setting Jesus straight. He said, man, you can't be talking like that, Jesus. And notice what he says. He says, far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. Notice what he says next. But he turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You know what Peter's problem was? Peter was always keen on how much he thought he loved God. He was always fixated on how much he thought he loved Jesus. That's why when the Roman soldiers came into the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was like, not on my watch, Jesus, because I love you so much. And he pulled out his dagger and chopped off Jesus' ear. Isn't that what he did? I'm sorry, Malchus' ear. Isn't that what Peter did? But when he was confronted about his association with Jesus, three times he denied him. You know why? Because our love and our profession of our love for God sometimes isn't enough. That sometimes our love for God changes with the winds of disappointment. When God doesn't show up the way we thought he would, when the promise doesn't unfold the way we thought it should, sometimes the profession that we make of how much we love God can fail us. But there's a second disciple. You all ready for this? There's a second disciple named John. And five times... I want you to hear this. Five times in the Gospel of John, John describes himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Not like Peter trying to prove how much he loved Jesus and his love for Jesus failing him. This other guy five times said and refer to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And guess who was the only one at the cross 
when Jesus was crucified with the mother of Jesus, Mary, standing at the foot of the cross. It wasn't Peter who said, oh, God, I love you, and then tucked tail and ran when he was confronted. It was the disciple who understood how much he was loved by Jesus. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Because your profession of how much you love God sometimes can fail. Like Peter's love failed when he was confronted with adversity. But for those who know how much Jesus loves them, it'll take you all the way to the cross. In spite of the adversity and in spite of the opposition. So what are we talking about here? What are we talking about here? Listen, the way we move in the world, my ability to love Wendy, is a direct result of Ray Harmon learning to embrace who God created me to be. And the only way I can settle that is like John recognizing that Ray Harmon is the disciple that Jesus loves. Imperfect as you are. Remember, first John says this is love. Not that we loved him but that he loved us first. Listen, I guarantee you, when you recognize how much God loves you, a perfect God, a blameless, flawless God, how much he loves you, it, you listen, it ain't going to matter what they said about you. Because you know you're loved by God. It's not going to matter what the critics say. Uh, what your fans say, you ain't going to be moved by none of that. Jesus wasn't moved by any of that. Because the truth is, if you live for the applause and praises of men, you will die by the voice of your critics. Jesus didn't need none of that. Saul lost the kingdom over a song. Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain, and he lost his mind over the praises of people. You know why? Because he wasn't settled and affirmed in how much God loved him. And whoever you allow to king you, whoever you allow to crown you, you will owe your allegiance to. And that's why God, uh, David lived to please God. And Saul lived to please the people. David was God's anointed. Saul was the people's choice. These are things we need to settle in our heart because they are impacting our ability to love our neighbor. And God said, all of the law, all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Pastor Wendy. I wonder if that statistic that Dove put out is a lot more less, if there are fewer women. Oh, have wow. we it's descended to 2%? Mm. Because in 2011, we didn't have TikTok. Mm. We didn't have Instagram. Mm. And as communications have advanced, there are more opportunities for us to judge mm. what the world deems as beautiful and acceptable mm. and for us to be down on ourselves. Wow. Uh, even myself, I had to, and I've been to Bible school and I love Jesus. I've walked for him a long time, but there were a few years ago and I had to um, unfollow some women that I was looking up to, especially women in ministry, because what I started seeing a few years ago were lots of Gucci belts, lots of red bottom shoes, lots of, I'm looking to hear a word and how to love our congregation. I mean, I'm looking to be uh, in church leadership, what, what God has called me to be, but I want to look up and have these minister, these mentors from afar and as I started seeing these women in ministry, I felt like, well, I don't even want that much attention around my midsection. So I, I don't have a Gucci belt. And, mm. and uh, you know, 
I don't have red bottoms. I was homeschooling Levi at the time. Mm. And I wondered, so if that's the standard of ministry, I'm not meeting the mark. Right. So does that make sure, that, that, does that make, mean that I don't fit in right. because I don't run in those circles? And so mm. I began to unfriend people, not because of what they were doing, but because of where I was. I had to readjust where I was getting my self-worth. And I've, again, I was baptized October 12, 1982. I have walked with Jesus a long time. I spent time in Sunday school. I've been to Bible school. I've been through ministry training. I married a pastor. And a few years ago, I still found myself in that struggle. And so as we were talking about loving ourselves, I think we have unknowingly accepted cues from the culture. Right. We unknowingly think that if we have any type of confidence in ourselves that we're being arrogant, mm. that we aren't being humble, right. that we aren't walking in love, that we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Well, a person, as John, who thinks, you know what, God loves me and I'm accepted. Right. Look at where he can operate out of. Mm. He can operate from the overflow. If you feel like you are ugly and people don't like you, and if you tell yourself a lie and believe that, okay, my presentation and who I am showing up as in the world is not accepted, then that is going to make you extra selective. It's going to make you defensive. But the word of God is so true. I didn't give this one to you, Jewel. So before I get to the Psalm 139, uh, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says this. It mm. says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Yeah. He that does not love does not know God. For God is love. As Pastor Ray was speaking, you know what I was thinking about? So if I don't love myself, mm -hmm. then do I really know God? Right. See, I can show up at church and serve, and I can love Shavonda, and I can have a good time with, with Aaron, and all of these things outwardly, and think I'm doing good works, but be so critical of myself yeah. that it can... Sh it show up, up as a flaw in my relationship with God because when Andrea came up, if God is extending, extend your hand of love, and then I'm like, no. Right. But I'm going to love Levi, and I'm going to say, oh, he's so wonderful, and then God is extending his hand of love, and I'm just like, I'm not worthy. Right. That lets us know that there is a disconnect in our relationship, and not to the point where you've got to look down on yourself, right. but it is an awareness. Oh, that this gift, I am going to learn to embrace. How do we learn that? We have to look to his word. Amen. Psalms 139, verse 14. I'm going to read from the NIV. It says, I praise you because mm. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. That's a foundational scripture that we need to hide in our hearts. I praise you because... Yes, because he's worthy, but because of his greatness toward us, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. Proverbs 19, 8 in the New Living Translation says, to acquire wisdom is to love yourself. Good, good. And I think in all of our teaching and preaching that this is an area we have forgotten beyond Sunday school to really drive home with you. Like the beginning of wisdom for me is to love myself. Now, I have friended most of those church leaders back because I'm in a different spot of maturity. I can celebrate red bottoms. I'm like, go head on, black wealth. <laughs> you know, I'll just do something to celebrate about. I'm like, wear your Gucci belt because you've been working out. I've been making gluten-free cookies. So amen, I'm gonna amen. celebrate my sister. And so I'm in a different place, but I had to even readjust, you know what? My worth doesn't come from what I have right. because I can guarantee you this. We laid our dear sweet brother Julius to rest on this past Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the entire time that Julius was going through and fighting for his life, he didn't care what we had on. Correct. But it did make a difference that we showed up. Absolutely. 
And when we laid him to rest, when Pastor Ray eulogized him, nobody in that congregation was trying to inspect his suit. Mm. But they saw what a loving, beautiful God that Julius served. And if they loved Julius, they could love the God that he loved and that loved him. Amen. I still have more scriptures. Ephesians 2.10 says this. Mm. And I want you to, to, to hide these things in your heart as you are building another layer to your relationship with God mm. that, okay, if I know that God loves me, I can operate so more freely with others. I don't have to give out of a works-based faith that I can really give because I know what has been given to me. Ephesians 2.10 so says, good. for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Loving yourself is a good work. Yes, it is. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 5.29 out of the NIV says this. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, mm. but they feed and care for their body, mm. just as Christ does the church. And every time I read this scripture, because I taught school for a long time before we were in full-time ministry, and I have had the opportunity to um, be made aware and minister to, to students who have been doing self-harm. They aren't loving themselves. Uh, or they, it could be self-harm, whether it is self-harm, we may have children watching, or it can be some other forms of not being their best. But we can see from the word that to acquire wisdom is to love ourselves, that we do love our own body. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, okay, I need to bathe and get dressed. I need to get something to eat. I have all of these things to do on my list, but in order for me to fulfill my to-do list, I need to make sure I've got me some coffee and that I've, you know, showered and my hair is done. That is a self-care and it is a form of love. We don't go and present ourselves to people and we haven't put ourselves together so when we see somebody who is maybe struggling in that area of, of presenting themselves or taking care of themselves it's not a point of judgment that's a person we want to wrap our arms around and not say oh girl you can do better than that just to really grab their hand and say you know what I'm here for you right. and I want you to know first of all that God loves you with an everlasting love yeah. and there is no distance that you can be that mm. you are too far from that love Amen. that we want to lead from Amen. that when we see people struggling in their own self-care I know that uh, self-care is a big word it's it's kind of a bu buzzword in our culture but it is so true we do need to care for ourselves. And we go back to this example, it seems so old, but we were on a flight last week, and what did they tell you? If the air pressure in the cabin drops, right. you are to put the oxygen on yourself first. Yeah. That's not being selfish. That is placing yourself in a position to be able to best help the children or somebody that Come is on. with you. So we don't find it selfish. Right. Just in an everyday, natural kind of carnal, I don't know if that's carnal, I don't know what the word, but just in an everyday, let me take care of myself so that I can take care of others. So well, I want us to translate, let me love myself so I can best love others. And you have the word of God that says that mm. we are called to love ourselves mm. and out of that love and relationship with God, we can love others and we can be our best. Yeah. And so it, that was such just such a heartbreaking picture. Yeah. And I don't want to just leave it to the women in the Dove study, but I could see that with myself. Yeah. I mean, I just said I don't want to bring attention to and nobody's thinking about my midsection. And then I brought <laughs> attention to it, you know, and as I wrap this section up, uh, years and years ago, uh, before we even had children, we did a little bit of time um, down at the Potter's house. And one day Bishop Jakes was preaching and it was in the context of loving yourself. And he said, um, don't talk people out of loving you. Yeah. And he said, when somebody comes and says, oh, Shavonda, your hair looks so cute. And then Shavonda could respond and say, oh, you know, I just did this or I had my friend do it because she's in cosmetology school. Well, I just yeah, like here, the here's cute one, hair. Here's one. Oh, girl, I love that dress. What, this ugly thing? Right. <laughs> Isn't that what we say? Yeah. And then we explain where we got it. I got it on sale mm -hmm. for $9.99. Someone just said you were beautiful. Right. Right. And you just talked yourself out of it. You know where that comes from? 
It comes from how you see yourself. They see your beauty. You see your flaws. Sorry for interrupting, Pastor Winnie, but I had to jump in on that. I was going to use that one. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> we on the same wavelength. But, Siobhan's but, hair looks so cute, so I had to put her in it, but it was the dress, it was the example. But that's yeah. okay, because we are one. We are one. Can yes. I jump in now? I knew that that was your... So I'm just going to slide on down slide to the there? floor because I can't really fit up here, but I'm not saying too much about right. it. So this is where we're going to close, mm -hmm. right? This, close this is where on. We're gonna close. close on, brother. All right? Because we're, 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 we're out of time. We're out of time. Here it is. So last week we talked about this man that Jesus saw. He had been in this condition 38 years. Jesus saw the man, and the scripture says he knew that this man had been in this condition a long time. Uh, we highlighted the fact that this wasn't the only man at the pool of Bethesda, that there were multitudes of people who had needs, yet Jesus saw just this man. Jesus didn't only know the man's position, but he knew the man's condition. Yeah. Yeah. That he had been waiting for the stirring of the waters 38 years. Yeah. But notice, he had no man to put him in. Somebody say relationships. Hmm. So Jesus said to the man, do you want to be made well? And we said last week, don't assume that just because you want it for them that they want it for themselves. Because some people are comfortable in their dysfunction and they have normalized their dysfunction. And sometimes we normalize our dysfunction because that means we got somebody we can blame for where we are. I've got nobody to help me, so I'm stuck. Jesus says to this guy, listen, <laughs> your healing is standing right in front of you. Do you want it or not? And notice his response. His response was, I ain't got nobody to help me. Again, the excuses. The simple yes and no question. I ain't got nobody to help me. Somebody else jumps in before me. The water is only stirred once. And when the water stirs, if you don't get it, somebody. Isn't that what we do sometimes? We talk ourselves out of what God wants to do in our lives. So this is where we're going to close. Here it is. I'm going to give you four things. Fast and furious. Y'all ready? Number one. I'm talking about the work we need to do on ourselves. Because a lot of times we think our waiting season is a wasted season. But what God wants to, us to do while we wait is to wait with expectation. After 38 years, man, you could just give up and just say, well, this is the way it's always going to be. Are you with me? So Jesus wants us to remember that just because I've been waiting doesn't mean the promise has been revoked or removed. Everything that God said about you is still true. So let God finish the work that he started and wait with expectation. Here's something I really think the Lord wants us to hear. This is number, number three. Y'all ready for this one? Recognize that while you wait, Ishmael's are the things we create when we grow impatient. Mm -hmm. Recognize that while you wait, Ishmael's are the things you create when you grow impatient. You know what that means? God says you're going to have Isaac and uh, it's taking too long. It's going to take 25 years. So let me just help him out. And let me fix me up and get my own Ishmael. Number four. The blessing you make for yourself is always less than the blessing from God that you thought you missed. Listen to me. Ishmael will never become Isaac. 
it will always be less than what you thought you missed. The thing that you are trying to create in your haste, because it's taking a little bit longer than you thought it should, will always be less and will always cost you more than the blessing you thought you missed. Number five, here it is. If we're going to learn to love ourselves, Jesus said these three things. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. Number five, if you're going to be all that God has created you and called you to be, this is a tough one. You've got to be willing to do hard things. From where this man sat, Jesus said, you get up. There's no evidence that Jesus offered him a hand and helped pick him up. You know what rise means? Rise means, ah, uh, here it is, position yourself for what's next. Number two, he says, take up your bed. It means get rid of the old because he had been sitting on that bed. It was just a mat for 38 years. He said, time to pick up that thing you've been sitting in so long. You're way too comfortable with this. Get up. Now, with every instruction God gives us, he also gives us the grace to fulfill it. So when he says, rise, there's power from God that empowers me to rise. When he says, take up your bed and walk, he gives us the power to do it. You know the only difference between a victor and a villain? It's their response to pain. I took Levi to see the Batman, and that was by far the darkest Batman ever. Come on, somebody. Bruce Wayne was super emo, man. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, it was like psychologically crazy. But when you watch the show, you know that Bruce Wayne suffered pain at an early age. He was an orphan. His dad died when he was young. Uh, and then you see the, the villain in the movie, he also had his pain that he dealt with at an early age. The difference between a villain and a victor, uh, victor, is their response to pain. Villains make pain their prison. Victors make pain their platform. Villains use their pain to make life painful for others. Victors use what once hurt them to help others heal. So when the scripture says, take up your bed, God says, take the thing that has constrained you and confined you. Take it up and return to it no more. Here's the final thing. He said, walk. Walking means you embrace the new because new wine requires new wine skins. And what that means is God wants you to see yourself differently. He wants, to see, he wants you to see the world differently. He wants you to see your relationships differently. And sometimes that's the hardest hurdle to overcome because it requires us to renew our minds and change our thinking. That I'm no longer a victim. I am loved by God. I am accepted. I'm chosen. So Father, tonight, tonight, as we wrestle with what he said about us and what she said about us that caused us to feel less than, not enough, mediocre, ordinary. Father, we lean upon the truth of your word that says in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave his life for us. Father, I pray that in this moment we will receive we will receive and accept all that you've said about us. And because a perfect God loves us, there's absolutely nothing that an imperfect person can say to make us feel less than what God has said about us. So Father, I ask you now in this moment to heal every hurt, to heal every broken place, and let your love cast out all fear about all things so that we no longer see ourselves as grasshoppers 
but we see ourselves as you see us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Did that help anybody tonight? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Listen, if you joined us online, uh, we just want to make some resources available to you. If you want to learn more about what it looks like to walk with Jesus and discover who you are in him, in Christ, we have some resources we want to send your way. Send us an email to echurch at weareconverge.com and our team will get those resources to you. If you just need someone to pray for you, send us an email to echurch at weareconverge.com. Now, I'm not 100% sure, Pastor Wendy, but I've got this feeling that as I was surveying the audience, I saw somebody that looked like my lifelong friend, Alan Brown, that I met in 1986 in Abidjan, La Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, West Africa. A1, is that you? That's A1. Come on, everybody show your love for my dude, Alan Brown. Oh my goodness. All the way, uh, are you in, in uh, Philly now? Wow, 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 wow. Such a blessing, man. Thank you so much for joining us. I know the last time you were here, we didn't get to connect, man, but it just means so much to me that you came out tonight to be a part of our worship experience. God bless you. Let's go eat some barbecue after this. Can we do that? Okay, let's do that. We're going to eat some good Texas barbecue. Nicholas, why don't you come, man, and send us out? Why don't you stand with us? In Jesus' name. Baby, why don't you pray for us and bless us, bless us out tonight. All right, lift your hands up really high. We're going to thank the Lord, and I'm going to bless you according yeah. to number 6, 24 through 26. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah. The Lord make his face to shine upon you yes. and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have an amazing week and remember that you are loved and yeah. you are accepted in him. Amen. Bye -bye. God bless you. We'll see you next week. If you were impacted by today's worship experience, we'd love to hear from you. Maybe today's sermon was exactly what you needed to hear or you prayed the prayer of salvation for the first time. If so, we've got some information that we'd love to send you to help kickstart your relationship with God. Or if you want more information on how to join our virtual family, please email us at echurch at weareconverged.com. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online safely and securely by visiting www.weareconverged.com forward slash give. Or you can give via text by texting Converge Give along with the dollar amount that you'd like to donate to 77977. Also, you can find all this information on our mobile app. Simply search the app or the Play Store for Converge Church Plano and download the app. It's that easy. Thank you again for joining us for today's worship experience. We look forward to staying connected with you.